if people at home can't hear us, just let us know that you can't hear us. Or I guess we should stand kind of in front of the computer. Yeah, because that's what the microphone is. So we'll have to kind of uh, orient here. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, Liz, if you want to control the presentation, that would be great. So yeah. welcome everyone to the AU Abroad and Career Center supporting students through internships abroad session. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> We're gonna start off with some introductions. So uh, my name is Matthew Stifter. I am the assistant director of our partner programs at AU Abroad. Um, and so my email is there and my phone number is there as well. Um, and I'm joined by my AU Abroad colleague, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Adema. I also work in the AU Abroad office, um, working on partner programs. We will go into a minute what that means, partner programs. And I'm Brian Rowe from the AU Career Center, I'm Director of Experiential Education. Uh, should I? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Wangwe Kimari, and I am Assistant Director at AU Nairobi. Okay, so in terms of what AU Abroad is and what we do, so we're the main office for undergraduate uh, study abroad programming. And we have over 100 programs in 30 countries. And we have some special programs that are specific, specifically AU owned and operated. And these are the AU centers in Nairobi, Madrid, and Brussels. Um, and then, sure. And um, the AU Career Center is one of three career offices on um, AU's main campus, not including the law school. Um, and our office. Uh, uh, does career advising and experiential learning support. Um, our office also includes the Office of Merit Awards uh, as well. Um, and we work with the College of Arts and Sciences, SOC, SOE, SPA, and the first and second year undergraduate students in SIS. Okay. The, your camera went off. Yeah. Okay. I'm just turning this camera on for a minute. Um, all right. So what do we do? Um, for anyone who's not familiar with our office, um, we meet with students to advise them on uh, our many programs that we offer. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one appointments with students to talk to them about those programs. Um, and in those appointments, we talk through a lot of things that are not just related to location, um, but also cover things like which programs meet their academic needs, um, location, of course, um, cost of program is something that we talk through, um, and the type of experience. So this is all to say, if you have students who are who mentioned study abroad, they're welcome to come to us um, if they know exactly where they want to go or if they have no idea where they want to go. So we have conversations with students that kind of are across the board. So send them to us and we're happy to talk to them about their options. And, the, and in the career center, we obviously we do career advising, which can be one on one advising with an advisor who um, has a specialization in the types of careers um, that a students from a certain school are usually interested in. So we provide education through workshops, uh, panels, um, and we develop and create a lot of advising materials, career education materials that students can access online. Um, experiential learning support. So AU, as we all know, internships um, in particular are a big part of experiential learning at AU, although not only the only type of experiential learning. Um, so my office works quite a lot with employers, faculty, and students around, especially um, internships. As a, as a side, we do also advise other types and recommend that students engage in other types of experiential learning, like study abroad, like uh, volunteerism, leadership, um, and, and others, student research within classes, for instance, with faculty. Um, and then my office also provides quite a few um, um, situations where students and employers are coming together. That could be job and internship fairs. It could be um, networking events or even one-on-one -on -one, um, employer engagement. 
I don't know how to move a Mac. <laughs> okay, and so throughout the rest of this presentation, we're going to do, or hope to do, five things. One is to go over the types of study abroad programs and how those intersect with internship opportunities. Um, present some possibilities that students have to intern through the AU Abroad office. Uh, talk about how the Career Center and uh, AU Abroad intersect in terms of support for student internships abroad. Uh, see how those internships map onto the NACE competencies, and Brian will go over what those are. Um, and then our colleague from AU Nairobi Wangui will go over uh, the AU Nairobi Center and use that as a case study for student thriving through internships. All right, so first, um, a little you know, basic information about study abroad. A lot of times when we talk to students, we talk to them first about the different types of programs. This is a really great thing for students to think about in as far as determining what kind of experience they're looking to have. Um, so I explain it to students like the programs are on basically a spectrum where on one end we have structured programs and on the other end we have direct enroll programs. So structured programs are programs where a student studies with uh, studies abroad with um, uh, either a group of AU students at one of our AU centers or a group of study abroad students from the US. Structured programs are programs designed specifically with study abroad students from the US in mind. There's usually a set curriculum on those programs and a really high level of support. On the other side of the spectrum is direct enroll programs. Um, so in these kinds of programs, a student is enrolling directly at a foreign institution. They're in class alongside students who are attending that institution. Um, so think of it like an exchange student. Um, it's a mo much more independent experience for students. Um, and they're experiencing the educational, the local educational system, um, which can be quite different from the American one. Um, we also do have some programs that are hybrid that are kind of a mix of structured and direct enroll, um, but just we like to put that out there for a basis of kind of understanding also how internships um, show up across these two different program types. So what do internships look like? Um, depending on the program type on a structured program, they're usually for credit. Um, oftentimes they're optional, but there are some programs that require an internship as part of it. Um, the Brussels Center is a, the Nairobi Center are good examples of those programs. Um, and usually there's a high level of support from the program to place a student at an internship. Um, on the other side for direct enroll programs, they may be for credit, just like here, right? Just like at a university, they may be for credit. Students might have gotten them independently. Um, Oftentimes they're optional or just not available. If they're not available, it could be for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those being, you know, visa restrictions, local laws, things like that. Um, and then those internships are usually independently secured um, by students through or supported through that university's um, career services or internship office. Yeah. And so what that means is we have over 40 programs where students can have internships, which is quite a lot. Um, so we'll have this slide, these slides sent out uh, to those who have attended and you'll be able to click on what the full list of programs with internships are uh, through our office. So that'll link to our main website. Uh, but to give you uh, an example, so our three centers, AU Brussels, AU Madrid and AU Nairobi, all three of them offer internships and they're actually required at AU Brussels and AU Nairobi, but there are also uh, some of our programs where internships are possible as well. So programs that we have in England, Italy, Germany, Chile, Greece, China, et cetera. And so there are a whole, basically like around the world, there are internships possible for students to do uh, through AU abroad. Now, some of these may require knowledge of a foreign language. So any of the internships that we host through our AU Madrid Center, uh, students will have to have near fluency in Spanish in order to achieve those uh, successfully, uh, but many don't. So, you know, Brussels is a Francophone city, but you do not need to know uh, French to do internships through our AU Brussels Center. And internships across disciplines. Um, 
at all these different locations. Yep. Yeah, no matter what academic area a student is in. And so here are some examples of our different centers and some of the internship sites that uh, we've sent students to in the past. Um, and so I won't go into much detail about AU Nairobi because Wangui will uh, talk a little bit about them uh, later. Uh, but in terms of AU Madrid, uh, we have these different organizations and they kind of run the gamut. So if anywhere from like, you know, a foundation that is poli uh, oriented politically to the Dra Dragones de Lava Pies, uh, which is basically like a little kid soccer team, uh, which is super cute. Uh, but, you know, that just kind of, showcases like the diversity of the types of internship sites that we have there. And then, you know, some other foundations, an English language magazine, um, and then an arts university. Uh, and then if you look at AU Brussels, these uh, internship sites are actually all in English. So uh, it's anywhere from the European Parliament, right, uh, to like human rights NGOs, like we have one called uh, SEGI, for example, the Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Royal Military Acad Academy of Belgium, which looks at transatlantic security. So um, it really goes anywhere from, you know, small community based organizations all the way up into, you know, supranational organizations like the European Union. Um, and then, of course, in, in Nairobi, it's a wonderful and huge spread, but I don't want to steal Wangui's uh, thunder, so I'll let her talk about it later. And when we look at how the Career Center would think about student thriving, right, the, the purpose for our conference today, um, the Career Center belongs to an or, a national organization called the National Organization, or sorry, Association of Colleges and Employers, NACE. We always call it NACE. We are constantly interacting with employers, and they tend to be larger employers, large employers, and there's a dialogue between universities and these um, large employers. You know, what what are what do they look for, right? So when a student um, graduates, for instance, what what are the skills that are going to make that student a an attractive candidate for a variety of jobs? Um, and and you know that in a way is how we see a student. You know, for our office, that is one way we see a student thriving. They're making very educated choices about their first uh, destination for employment after they graduate. Through the, their time at, at AU, we're helping them build experiences. Um, the students absolutely come to us and say, what can I do with a major in? And, you know, fill in the blank. Political science, sociology, English, French, right? Um, th they think that there is a set type or a number of jobs that are associated with that specific major. And while that is true sometimes, if you come to me and say you want to be a chemist, you know, I'm going to have a pretty specific answer about maybe what you'd like, what you should major in. The, for so many majors, there is not that answer, right? When a poli sci student says, what can I do with my major? The short, not very helpful answer is almost anything, right? That's not what they're looking for. So what we do is we want to reframe the question around career readiness and competencies. And NACE, in this organization, we're constantly querying the employers what are these skills? Or what are you looking for? So when we talk to a poli sci student or we talk to a sociology major, um, we begin to have this conversation around these competencies. If you look and, and you can Google, you know, research NACE career readiness competencies, it'll pull up quite a nice um, document for you. I pulled just one of the kind of sub bullets from each of the, there's another slide, there's an additional four after this, um, yeah, you can go to, thank you, thank you, Liz. Um, you'll see, I just pulled one from each of these, but there is a list under each of these kind of and leadership professionalism. And I thought, well, when we're talking about going abroad, for instance, what are the ones that sort of resonate most with that? And so I pulled these. So um, as we talk to students about their skills, making them aware of this, we look at an opportunity like going abroad and this is a fantastic way to sort of build these competencies, to, to enhance these competencies. Um, you know, by the way, do they gain these competencies in, in academic settings? Absolutely. Do they gain them in leadership and volunteerism? Absolutely. Do they part-time jobs? Absolutely. They, there's quite um, a flexibility about these um, readiness competencies. So fantastic. When a student comes back from study abroad, and we have conversations about interviewing, right? 
there's a, there's often questions about dealing with ambiguity. And every student that comes back from abroad is like, oh, I have about 12 examples of that, <laughs> right? So um, this is something that we look at and, and we are making students very aware of these, you know, think about this, think about, are you getting these? Do you think you need more if you're looking at a job in tech, right? And then obviously the tech competency is going to be more important to those jobs. But this is a framework that we often use as we're designing our career education materials um, and as we talk to students, right, about what they should be preparing for as they move forward and thrive. And then you have this intersection with AU abroad. So we have um, these, these internship opportunities. Um, I would say right now, our focus has been on the centers, right? For the most part, an example would be Brussels. The internship environment in Brussels is extremely competitive. You have students from European universities who would also love to um, intern in Brussels. So we have an enhanced level of support um, as, as you can see, some of the ways the Career Center is helping with these students, there's one-on-one -on -one individual meetings, often with me, um, about that. And we really reinforce what our very capable, skilled team in Brussels is teaching the students. Um, there is an emphasis on professionalism, right? Th this is the one opportunity where you actually have placement, and for the folks listening in from a career center office. Um, you know, placement is kind of the dirty word, right? It is, we're giving you the internship. We're sort of handing it to you. That's not what we do. But in a place like Brussels, for instance, that is needed. You know, it's difficult. It would be very difficult for a student here to search for um, um, uh, an internship directly in that very competitive environment. So they're given that support but there needs to be that enhanced level of professionalism and reinforcing um, the professionalism, making them very aware of the cultural differences so that when the team in, in Brussels is speaking with them, they're already um, aware, for instance, of maybe what, they, what they're about to hear, so. Okay, so now we're going to pass the baton over to our wonderful colleague from Nairobi. Um, and so, Wangui, feel free to take thank it away. You. And let us know when we need to change the next slide. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Liz. And thanks, Brian, for inviting me. So I'm Wangui Kimari. I'm the assistant director at AU Nairobi. And as part of this role, I teach three classes. One is called The Politics of Climate Change in Africa. The other is called Urban Youth Movements. And the final class I teach is a seminar that accompanies the internships that our students take. Um, thank you. And so I'll be talking a bit about AU Nairobi and how at AU Nairobi, we're trying to go above and beyond to help students thrive. And one way in which we're doing this is to have capacious internships that challenge and prompt students to have personal and professional growth. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Liz, can you please change? So just a brief history. First, AU Nairobi started in 2005, so almost 20 years ago. Uh, and since then, we've seen three cohorts who are coming, I, I mean, with a break for COVID, but three cohorts who are coming uh, in the fall, spring, and in the summer. And in the fall and spring, we have full, like a full semester where we do a very scaffolded internship experience. Uh, so we have two intense months of teaching where students take up to 12 hours of classes a week. And then the final two months are then left for a full on internship experience. Um, it has a program also with Brussels where we have some students who take part in a program called the Transcontinental Program. So they spend seven weeks in Brussels and then seven weeks in Nairobi. And we're starting a similar initiative as well in 2025 with the Madrid program, where we'll see students coming from Madrid to Nairobi, but this program, this particular initiative will also include travel to Tanzania. And through all of our classes and internships, as is uh, emphasized at AU, equally for us in Nairobi, 
we foreground experiential learning as part of class content and beyond. Uh, please, can you change to the next slide? So we welcome students from different fields and schools, and we try and have courses that can help them fulfill their requirements of di a diversity of degrees, whether it's public health. We usually have quite a big public health cohort. We have a lot of students from the School of International Service. And because it's Kenya and because of, I guess, conservation history in the country, we have students too who take part uh, in, a, in a diversity of programs for ecology, sustainability, and the environment. So for all of these different students, we have classes and specific trajectories that help them fulfill their, their so they help them earn credits and to fill, fulfill degree requirements. As I said earlier, we have students across all of the different semesters. And it's worth mentioning that for our internship process, although this is being debated now, as you likely all know, for our internships, we require students to fulfill 270 hours. And this comes to about, uh, depending on the internship, uh, but about seven, six to seven weeks of a full-time internship. Sometimes it's important to say that um, some students start earlier and when they leave, they can also continue with the internship program depending on how their relationship was. And so they can do this remotely. But what we require in order to give a credit is this 270 hours. And so accompanying this internship is a seminar with me for three to four classes across this time where we reflect on students' learnings and unlearning, any concerns they have, any reflections they have about the role of their organization in the country. And just, it's kind of a, a, a seminar to just take the pulse of the students and to make sure everything's okay, but also to make sure they're also interrogating their experiences and locating with it within the history of the country and also their future plans. Thank you. Please, can you change to the next slide? So this is just a two pictures from AU. The first is our classroom setting. And we are lucky. I wish I had a picture of our garden because we do have quite a large garden. And the second picture is from, a, from the 2023 summer cohort. Um, who visited the, the National Archives. So they're standing outside the Kenyan National Archives. There were about 13 of them, but the, these are just some of them. And usually we have up to 20 students. So habitually we've been having 20 students or so. Please, can you change to the next slide? So where do we send our students? Nairobi, I'm not sure if any of you have been there, but is uh, is a city with diverse, with a diversity of organizations. We have big civil society operations, and we also have uh, the headquarters of, for example, UN Habitat or the United Nations Environmental Program. However, we are really trying to make sure students get a feel of a working culture that's Kenyan. Certainly, obviously, all of our different workplaces are, are shaped by local and global dynamics. But we're really trying to anchor them in the particular concerns and a particular work environment that is Kenyan and that will allow them to forge relationships and build relationships and networks for the present and the future. So on the screen is an example of some of the organizations where our students have been going to for the last few years. Yeah, if they were interested in education policy or special education, or just equity in education, we send them to Dignitas, which has this as uh, its foci. If they're interested in climate justice, energy, uh, the green transition, we send them to the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, which is a governing association for, if I'm not mistaken, up to 12,000 small, I could be wrong, but thousands of small, uh, climate justice organizations from across the African continent. And so they work in both English and French. If they would like to be lawyers, and we have lots of students who've come who are interested in law, 
then we send them to the Katiba Institute, which in Kiswahili, Katiba means the constitution. So it's a, it really was founded to make sure that our most recent 2010 constitution is being, uh, is being followed so that there's constitutionalism across all sectors and particularly vis-a-vis -vis the state. If they're interested in urban design, um, and I'll show you, we'll see a picture shortly from a field trip some students and I had to uh, Kibira, which is where Konki Design Initiative works. But if they're interested in urban design, planning, uh, anthropology, and fields that an interest that uh, overlap with these different uh, fields, then we send them to the Konki Design Initiative. And if they're interested in queer rights, if they're interested in equity, uh, we send them also. There's also the option to send them to the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, which is a good partner of AU Nairobi. It's also important to add that we really use the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. Oh, we partner with them a lot because we have the students who have many concerns when they come to Nairobi, for example, if they're queer identifying. And so the NIGOL arc, that's how we that's how we put together the acronym are present during some of our orientation uh, programs, but are also there as a reference whenever we need them. So these are but some of our internship opportunities. It's worth mentioning that we also have students who are interested in uh, beyond climate change and sustainability, they're interested in wildlife and conservation. And so we have organizations such as Wildlife Direct, where we have sent interns over the last few years Thank you. Please, can you change the slide? So um, I hope this picture is bigger for you than it is for me, but this is a picture from uh, with some students where we went to Kibira, which is an informal settlement in Nairobi, to, to witness the amazing work that was being done by community members and the Konki Design Initiative when, when it came to flood uh, resilience in the face of flood. So it's not so visible from the, the picture, but I just thought it was putting it there uh, because this was a really critical site where community members and the Konki Design Initiative had come together to design this of what formally would say an informal landscape to make sure that there was flood resilience. Uh, maybe that whether that was by warning people with flags, if there was um uh there were sorry if there was expected flooding or even the ways in which they designed the public space so i just thought it would it was worth showing that there um thank you please can you change to the next slide so what do how do students think about internships how do they feel about internships i just thought i would take so that it's not just my propaganda or my words but two excerpts from papers that I marked this, this past uh, summer, actually. One student writes, I'm humbled and honored to have interned at PACCHA. So this is the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance for the past seven weeks. And I'll carry the lessons I've learned in Kenya for the rest of my life. Working at PACCHA expanded my knowledge on energy policy and African development challenges, and I've plan to apply my learnings to the United States context. After this internship, I'm much more confident in my choice to pursue a career in energy policy, and I look forward to building upon my foundational knowledge next semester at American University. I'm now certain that my future career goal is to fight the modern climate crisis by addressing energy transition challenges within the United States. I just want to flag that this across the board were, were the sentiments of students who initially certainly for the first week may have um, teasing issues settling into internships, whether it's language, whether it's a different work culture, but ultimately all of them, and in, in the almost two years that I've been at AU, everyone has affirmed that their internships have really given them much to think about, have made them have a much more nuanced focus in the work they'd like to do. 
and have allowed them to build meaningful relationships. Maybe I share one more. Please, can you change to the next slide? This is also from this summer. So this student writes, in conclusion, the Horn of Africa Youth Network, or HOAN, is, is an amazing organization focused on empowering and engaging the youth population in Kenya and many other countries in the East African region. If I had to categorize my time at HOAN, I would describe it as 70% good and 30% bad. Although the director of the organization did put a damp on my first few weeks with the organization, I, can let the, I cannot let that overshadow the rest of my time there. I developed amazing relationships with the rest of my coworkers and felt I was truly helping the organization and specifically my department. I believe this internship helped me acclimate to Nairobi even smoother and allowed me to settle down relatively quickly and better than I would have otherwise. In the end, I'm extremely grateful for this experience and hope to return to Kenya in the near future. The partially why I also wanted to flag this uh, excerpt from a student is to show that it's uh, Kenyan internships are great. They're not uh, always going to be perfect for everyone. But even when they have challenges, perhaps with directors or staff, for the most part, across the board, students are happy to thrive and they do feel that these internships offer a way for them to learn above all. Uh, question many things, many biases that they may have had naturally uh, about Kenya or about development, but above all, really, they felt that they're growing. And even if some of them are not able to put it down so articulately or pinpoint exactly what they're saying, ultimately, all of them were grateful to have had the opportunity to come to Kenya and to participate in these internships. And just by way of conclusion, I would also say that we really try as staff at the AU Nairobi Center to offer as much support and and uh, just honor the, also the feelings that students are having that they're going through because certainly in six weeks, you are figuring out culture shock, you're figuring out a new work culture. So we really endeavor to be very supportive. We also have a counselor should anyone need it. Um, if they need extra support, and this counselor is, uh, can be paid for by the student's health insurance that they get locally. And so we try and do our best uh, to help them thrive. And I think that's all for me. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Liz and Brian. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll open it up for any questions that you might have. And if you want to, people on Zoom want to just like do the hand raising thing, yeah, that could work too. We can look at that. Yes. Um, are the internship programs available only for undergrads, or are there also opportunities for less special cases too? Yeah, so we actually do have summer internships available for graduate level students. Uh, for any of the schools um, at our centers in Madrid, Brussels, and Nairobi. Um, and so, with, like I mentioned in the presentation, the requirement for the one in Madrid would just be uh, basically either being a native Spanish speaker or testing at like a high level or testing out. Um, and then the other two would just be, you know, being a good student, regular GPA, all that kind of stuff. But um, it would, there are some of the centers that are better accommodated for particular programs. Um, and so, you know, if you know, there was a particular question about a program, um, they could meet with one of us and you know, straighten it out for any grad student interested. Yep. I have a question. Um, certainly, like in, a, in the domestic context, we talk about you know, basically the cost associated, particularly with an unpaid internship, because students, if they're you know, working, let's say, to get through college, they may not have the, the time or the means to afford a free internship. If you're going abroad, you know, everyone in AU abroad assures me that they try to make things pretty much cost neutral. But I'm wondering if there's full access or comparable barriers when a student is abroad and hoping to intern. 
I mean, I think, I mean, the, there's always going to be like, so we try our best as possible to, uh, you know, mitigate the cost and make it cost neutral, especially with having the model that we do and keeping students enrolled as uh, fully matriculated as a student, which allows any of the financial aid, right, to, to transfer over for the term. Um, so, but, you know, most of the time we're restricted by the student visas that the students are on. Um, and they just can't work legally there, or at least work for um, uh, for money, right? And so just by that ipso facto, they cannot get compensated for any of the internships. You know, when students come to me and present that as an issue, there's kind of like, there's a few different ways to handle that. One could be like, you know, it, this is an additional cost that you might want to seek out additional funding specifically for this semester, um, you know, either through whatever means available on campus that would otherwise be accessible to them um, or to like, you know, go in a fall and then spend that summer like working and saving up for it basically. Uh, but there's not like an easy answer, at least, you know, from an AU abroad expect perspective. I mean, some of the ones abroad because they are for credit, um, some a student might be able to look at it that way and say, okay, I'm not like, doing 15 credits and then ha also having an internship, like I'm doing 12 credits and then there's an internship class as part of it. It's kind of built into the semester with that placement um, that we don't say placement. Will we say placement? In, in this case, it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think that factors. I mean, the same things here, what happened abroad is here, there could be commuting costs and things like that, but um, for credit, you can think of it as like a twofer, an internship plus you're getting credit towards your major or at least degree. Other questions? If, sorry, if I can just add something. At AU Nairobi, we really try and make sure students don't have to do internships far away. And as much as possible, when they're going to those internships, we get them to carpool. So. Uh, for example, if we have students going to an area called Ngong Road, we try and make sure that they all they're going together so that reduces their transport costs. And sometimes, um, a lot of places where students have internships is, and they, I mean, again, for sure they shouldn't count on this, but there's often communal lunch cooked together. There's often tea offered throughout the day, and so in a small way, certainly it's maybe not that substantive, but uh, students are able to kind of uh, watch their costs. Thank you. Other questions? Or anyone else? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you see a lot of students taking like the initiative to do like the no credit internships? Is that like encouraged to do in the long run when it's not like built into their program? So I I often have conversations with students who like the idea of doing an internship when they're abroad. Um, and then when they hear about the time commitment of an internship abroad and contrast that with their vision of what their free time will look like, sometimes drop the idea to do um, an internship. That's what I often see. If I can add to that, um, because you brought up non-credit internships. So the Career Center manages um, uh, some financial aid funds to support unpaid internships. These have to be non-credit. And that's because this is financial aid money. It's their rule. You know, um, it, there's a logic behind it. But we structured, it's called the Eagle Internship Fund. We communicate directly with all students who are eligible, right? That's not the majority of students, so we don't kind of put it out there very broadly because most students aren't eligible. But we are in communication with any student who's eligible, financial aid determines eligibility. I've specifically designed that to be completely border, you know, borderless, right? So if a student had a non-credit internship overseas and they were eligible, so they're showing considerable um need, documented need, um, I could provide, the career center can provide um, $3,000 for an internship. So, but it has to be non-credit. 
which is why I didn't mention it, you know, because so many of the uh, so interns, right, right, for full credit, so they wouldn't be able to. So if you ever have a student and you're wondering, you can contact me and I can check to see if that's, you know, if they would be eligible to work with a student. There also are some countries that are like actively against unpaid internships. So students run up against that and they go looking for internships in certain countries. Any questions from the Zoom sphere? Yeah. Any other questions here? Liz, if I could just add something about grad students. Um, yes. We don't have very many. Uh, in my time there, since last summer, we've had only one. But we really are keen to try and make this more possible for grad students. And we're happy to work with their supervisors, the career center, to try and curate a process that works for their needs. So please, uh, I hope it doesn't seem like we just cater to undergrads. We really are keen to welcome all students and we just try we recognize that they have diverse needs and we want it to be more specific so we take it uh in the time i've been there on a case-by-case -case basis and try and curate a process that's comparable to the undergrad students but obviously at a higher level and uh, for what is required and most of our internship spaces actually love having graduate students because of the research and writing skills that they've acquired while while being in school. Okay, so this is our contact information. So if you have any questions that come up after the session or right now, we have okay. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, AU is a unique, I can't speak for universities across the country. AU is really unique um, in that study abroad is a major reason why students choose to come to AU. Um, it's just part of the culture here. And we hear from students all the time in our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Like, I've been waiting to study abroad. I came to AU for study abroad. Yeah. Like, how soon can I study abroad? Um, so it is a huge factor. And, and I also tell students all the time too, like, you know, AU kind of creates this bubble where you think like studying abroad is a really common thing. Um, and it's not, it's like less than 10%, less than 5% yeah. nationally. Yeah, at AU, it's 65%. Um, nationally, it's 10%. So even just having study abroad on your resume, right. in addition to all those nice skills that Absolutely. come from it, right. yeah. even that quote from that one student in Kenya about third, it being 30% not good and 70% great, that 30% not good is going to provide really rich interview material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as long as they do it right, right? Um, <laughs> But also that's the nature of work, right? You know, we have these experiences in our work. No job is 100% absolutely positive all the time. And if you have that job, please talk to me about it because I want to come work with you, right? So, but yeah, that's part of the learning process as, as they develop. And I think that, that it was a great question too. I mean, there is this study abroad just isn't, okay, show up one day and fly away, right? There's a process, they're really engaged, they're learning, they may be coming to me to talk about, you know, the, the um, interview process, for instance. Um, so, so they are kind of really engaged before and during, and maybe even after too, right? So, yeah. yeah, and as far as like building community too, like the AU centers, right. you know, our programs was only AU students. So I was way back when SIS undergrad and went to Nairobi, and met, you know, 17 AU students who I hadn't met on campus. So students are getting even more connected to AU, especially through the centers mm -hmm. where they're coming back, like connected to a whole nother group of students from the university. Yeah, and I mean, it's like basically cohort building, the same as a lot of the other programs at the university. 
Um, and, you know, some of these people, like even anecdotally, have been in contact with those same people they studied abroad with, like 10, 20, 30 years later. Um, so when you talk about like engagement and retention, like that, I, it just hands down, I think study abroad does it. And it, it's often in the junior year, correct? Mm -hmm. That's like a very yeah. common year. So then they're either back, you know, second semester junior year, or they come back as seniors. And that's the year where they're really kind of angling for what comes next, right? So, so they often come back with these, when Gui shared these amazing quotes, you know, they're very motivated. They're very sort of engaged at that point to move forward. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. But they can go to the centers in the summer as soon as they're... after their second year. So yeah, after their second year of university, they can study abroad at the centers for that summer as an undergrad. No, after their first year. Okay. Yeah, after the first year. <laughs> Sorry. After the <laughs> later the first year of university, they can study abroad as an undergrad and do it as one of our centers. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> But mostly they go for a full semester junior year. That's the most common. Yeah. But yeah. Right. Other questions? That was a great question. I think in first to different students, so the cornerstone program, which is the first year students, they, yeah. they have an uh, a option to intern and join as part of their program. Is that correct? So corner or, or study abroad. Cornerstone, they don't intern abroad. But they, have, they, they have, study, it's a Cornerstone program is like a special cohort program that enables them to study abroad. Study. So yeah, study. in their first year at yeah. AU where they otherwise could not. And then there's another version of Cornerstone where they yeah. intern okay. here okay. domestically, right? Okay. So <laughs> there is, they're both so, Cornerstone, yeah. but so you're either clear. in the study abroad cohort, right? Which is how many, I think, not huge, right? 25. Yeah. And then there's the internship, domestic internship cohort, which is pretty big. It's over 100. Okay, but they're, in, okay, they're not yeah. intern, but study. Right? Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no? All right. So, okay, they're going to see it. Yeah. Well, that's just fine. It's fine. Okay. Where is she? Wait, are you presentation camera? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Literally seeing your background. <laughs> social <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So oh yeah. If people if you can fill out the survey to let us know how we did. Thank you. <laughs>